lot of these things that I've, I know I've given you these things before. Uh, in Ezra chapter 9, Nehemiah chapter 9, and Daniel chapter 9 are some of the greatest confessions of prayer that you'll ever read in the Bible. Uh, and again, it's about uh, not just individuals. Like Psalm 51 is David's personal confession of sin. You, you have to have that somewhere in your life where you sat down with God and said, Lord, I have sinned against you. And God answers back and says, yeah, I know you've sinned. Now tell me what they are. So you open up and you said, Lord, I'm so ashamed that I did this. I said this. I went here. My hands practiced this. Uh, Lord, I thought this. This was in my life. Uh, you see your sin. You're able to point pinpoint. You know, it's like when you all talk about, um, boy, you was talking about it when you had the infection. You don't want the doctor to say, well, it's in there somewhere. I don't you know, from the top of your head to the sole of your feet, you got infection in there somewhere. Well, way to go, Doc. Uh, my crazy preacher, he's a quackologist. He could tell me that. And he's even got a remedy for it. Ramps. Ramps. <laughs> so, but you want that doctor to say, we've pinpointed where the infection is at. God does the same thing with sin. It's not good enough. Oh, I'm a sinner. Yeah, we're all sinners. Wherein lies the sin? That's the question. So you start pinpointing. This is where I'm at offense against God. This is where I failed God. And you start seeing in this that where the sin lies in a nation. Where's the sin of our nation at? So you're able to say, well, we've legalized sin. Well, they desecrated the Lord's death. They have no honor for it. They don't want the book. They don't want, I mean, you can see where the sin lies. Now you get inside the home. You see broken families. And you can see uh, parents and child relationships. You can see abuse. You can see uh, the, the issues in the home that is repeating pattern now of sin and iniquity. And then you get into the individual. What about you? What about me? Where do I stand? Where's the church sins at? Identifying these things. So Ezra 9, Nehemiah 9, Daniel 9, they are identifying the church sins. We have sins. They use that plural pronoun. You know, it's one thing if someone, I used to hear someone pray like this all the time. They would say, and their sin, and you sin. They was always pointing the finger. And they never ever said, I sin. You start with I. And out of that comes a greater awareness of where we're, where we're standing. Ezra has to deal with this. When Ezra gets to, the, the, the judgment had already happened. They, they had been reduced to captivity for 70 years. They were sent into Babylon. Uh, God delivered them, allowed for them to come back to Jerusalem. We started building the walls. They restarted building the temple and all that. But they still had sin in the midst. And God's just not going to bless sin. So they call Ezra to come up. And Ezra is a priest. So he's called to sit down with them and tell them the word of God. The do's and the don'ts, the laws, the commandments. And to instruct them on keeping those things. And when he does, the people come to him. What we're going to read here in Ezra 9. And the people are going to start to confess, hey, we've, we've got a problem. We've got a sin that we've got to deal with. And it breaks forth this great confession that Ezra prays uh, for, for himself, for the people, to make the wrongs right. In order to have revival, wrongs have to be made right. You know, I, I want so bad when we talk about revival that God just sees it. Some soul. You know, Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, was one, is known as the Prince of Preachers. Time he was in his 20s, he was preaching to, to thousands of people in the Metropolitan Tabernacle in, in London. And preached and served up in, I think he was in his 50s, uh, towards 60, uh, and, and preached to, to thousands that was there in London. They'd come to hear him preach. 
wrote uh, edit, uh, article in the paper, clear in the United States, they would repost it. And again, he was in the 1800s uh, with this. But he never gave an altar call. He said, if the Holy Spirit is convicting you, he said, you come to me. And we'll, and we'll sit down with the Word of God and deal with this. Never, never gave an altar call. And scores of people would come to Christ out of direct conviction of the Holy Spirit. So a lot of other preachers began to identify with that. One of them was uh, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. And he preached in London as well, but this was in the uh, 1900s. And he preached the same way. So he had a guy that had came like three straight weeks. And a guy met him at the door and he said, he said, I'm under conviction. I need to talk with you about my salvation, about getting saved. And he said, okay. He said, next Sunday, put him off a week. He said, next Sunday at two o'clock in the afternoon, you'll meet me in my study and we'll sit down and we'll talk about it. So the whole week goes by. Next church service happens that morning. He's preaching. And the guy comes to him and he says, oh, that's right. I'm supposed to meet you at two o'clock and talk to you about getting saved. And he says, you don't need to. He says, why? Is the conviction gone? No. Have you lost interest? No. He says, well, then why don't I need to meet with you? He says, because when you was preaching at 1122, Christ entered into my heart and I'm now born again. Salvation. Man, that's, that's talk about the fire is hot. That ain't no man saying, let me tell you a story to jerk your emotions. Let me have Jeremy the juggler up here to entertain you for a while and say, hey, all you that want to get saved and, and skip hell and get to heaven, why don't you come make this decision and repeat after me? No, Christ entered in. You know how hard it is to find someone that says, let me tell you how I got saved. Let me tell you how I was born again. Let me tell you what Jesus did for me. It's hard, isn't it? They continue in their sins. We continue in our sins. I continue in my sins. There is no salvation from sin, deliverance from sin, apart from Christ. He's everything to us, isn't he? So therefore, when we see sin, we know it to be directly in conflict with God. And any time I read about it, Anytime I see it, there are phrases, there are words, those word studies I was talking about. They grip me. They just draw my attention to them. And I'm going to point some of them out to you today here in Ezra 9. Because, again, it's just one of the best prayers in all the Bible. And this is what, again, I would love to see. I don't want the conditions of this. I try to warn against this. But I do want the prayer of this. So, I want to read this. I guess I got to start in verse 1. So it's a lengthy passage. So I'm going to read fast and you're going to listen fast. Right? Amen. Dad. Amen. Go ahead. So 9 1. Now, when these things were done, the princes came to me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites, they have not separated them, them, themselves from the people of the lands. Doing according to their abominations, even of the Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Termites, I always got through that. Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and the Amorites, okay? All those ites, you know the command. What was they supposed to do? Kill them all. Not, you have no business with them. They were supposed to destroy them all. They didn't destroy them all. And he said, I'm going to leave them now, and they're always going to be a thorn in your flesh. So here we are, 1,500 years later, 1,500 years later, what are we dealing with? The same issues, because they didn't listen the first time. But here comes the princes and the people. Ezra, we've, we've got sin in the, in the midst. You can't even get people to say that hardly anymore. We've got sin in the midst. We've got to deal with this. So verse 2. They have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy seed, they have mingled themselves with the people of those lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and the rulers, they have been chief in this trespass. So what's the sin? 
What's the sin they, they just said? You were not supposed to marry. You're not to give your daughter to them, nor are you supposed to have them uh, to, to be brought into your home. Don't give them, don't take them, right? What business does light have with darkness? So when I tell them, don't bring Jezebel home or Delilah home and say, Dad, she's just so lovely. And I say, she's Jezebel. Don't look for my blessing. Now, I, I'm, the, I'm the cad. I'm the evil man but when I act this way because people said, oh, but you got to love them. I, I know what happens when you mix the holy seed. Nothing but sorrow. Go do it. Yes, Father, whatever you say, Father, I will obey you, Father. You know, that's what I want, but that's not what I get. So that's the sin. Don't, don't mingle with the world. What business does light have with dark? What business does Christ have with the law? What business does the children of God have with the children of this world? Paul goes through this in Corinthians. So again, Paul... Paul's another 600 years late. So for 2,000 years of biblical history, we've been dealing with the same problem. And I hate to say it, but in 2017, we're still dealing with it. I grew up watching it. I've watched in the churches. I've watched a wife. She could come, but her husband would never come. I could watch the husband come, and the wife came, and she sat there. I'm here because he wants to be here. I watched when the parents brought the kids because it was the right thing to do, but they had no interest in God. The kids loved Jesus. The kids loved Sunday school. The kids loved the, all the things that went with church, but the parents despised it, but they felt out of guilt and had to do it. And I've watched where the parents came, surrendered their hearts and their lives to Christ, and the kids are there. We're here because mom and dad made us to be here. And as soon as they got to be 18, 20 years old, guess where they was at? Going. I've seen this all my life. I know the problem of this sin. You ever hear this confessed? You ever hear this addressed? I don't. Well, that's my family member. You're talking about my family member. I'm talking about my family members. I'm talking about my uncles and aunts. I'm talking about my brothers and sisters. I'm talking about my kids. It's still in the midst. You think God... If, isn't God the same yesterday, today, and forever? And if God cursed them here, is he going to curse us? So let's deal with the problem. Let's confess it. Lord, we're unequally yoked. So, that's the problem, verse 2. That's the sin, the specific sin. Verse 3. And so when I heard this thing, now here's Ezra's response. When I heard this, I rent my clothes, my garment, my mantle, I plucked off the hair of my head. David, Paul, you guys are exempt from that one. <laughs> I plucked off the hair of my head and my beard. Ouch. And I sat down astonished. Why? Why such a strong response? Because he knew the price of the sin. Did he? You cannot see the high consequence of sin and take it lightly anymore. How did we get here in 2017? How did we get here? There was a path of sin for decades that has led us to this point, hasn't it? It brought us here. The sin was never confessed. It was never recognized. It was left to stay there. And again, once left, it's going to grow. It's going to, it's going to affect everything around it in this. And so Ezra realizes this. We as the church have to realize this. We, we are damning our future by allowing it to continue in this. So he pulls his hair out. He pulls his beard whiskers out. He rinses his clothes. And he throws himself down in anguish. When was the last time you was in anguish over something? Sorrow. Grief. 
urgency. You know, I, I, I make my fist. I don't want to punch it. Quick. Grip hold of that altar. Because I realize what it's cost us and what it's costing us in this. Repeat behavior. Repeat behavior doomed to do what? Break the same things, right? So if we see this in the Old Testament, and we see it in the New Testament, guess what we have to look forward to? I think somewhere along the line you can throw the emergency word. During revival, God allows for us to confess our sin, atone for our sin, repent of our sin, get back to Him. God says, okay, I'll take care of this. It's not that there isn't repercussions from choices of sin, but we can find God's grace and mercy in the midst of it. So Ezra, some may read that and say, well, I would never pull my hair out. I'd never pull my whiskers out. That's because you don't see the high consequence of sin. How much did, did, did Christ say it on the cross? Did he know the beating that he took was for the sins of the world? That Was sin counted lightly to the Father? Was sin counted lightly to the Son? Sin is only counted lightly to those that want to continue in sin. And I don't know any Christian like that. A Christian cannot continue in sin. Guilt and conviction just weighs too heavy on us. When you know you've sinned in that, it just eats away at you. And you got to deal with it. Religious people, a lost world, they can continue in sin and never bat an eye about it. Yeah, well, so what? Uh, you say, hey, that's sin. Well, I know another church that allows it. Well, I know another preacher. He, he says it's okay. It's always that. I always get that. So and so said it's okay. Never what the book says. Never what God says. It's always what another man said. Mom and Dad said it was okay. So, the book says this. Well, you know, hey, I ask another preacher about that, and this is what he says. I don't care what he says. Unless it's in Dan Bowser's commentary, I don't care. Some of you got that. But in my, in my personal, but accurate opinion, it's what the book says, right? You see, sin, these choices of sin has cost Israel. It's cost us. It's cost every empire and nation that has ever been in existence. It cost every family. It cost every individual. It cost every church. So it cannot continue unless you want to reap the same thing. I don't, I'm not a personal fan in favor of reaping punishment and judgment. Now you might be gung-ho for it. I am. So I want to throw the emergency break. And I want to, I want to have this. Lord, I just, I can't stand it. I can't continue in this. Every time, I, every time I read the newspaper and I see the headlines that we've talked about, it is a reminder to me, again, we are reaping what we have sown in this unconfessed, unrepented sin. So Ezra's action to me is not drastic. It should be our, the norm in this. Verse 4, So there were assembled unto me everyone that trembled at the words of God of Israel. Now right there, I talk about phrases that jump out and grab my attention. Do you see? You ought to know me well enough by now. Do you see it? Those that trembled at the word of God. Not because I had too much caffeine and I'm shaking. Or I had too much Mountain Dew and i am got the jitters. No. Or the palsy. No, I'm trembling at the word of God because it invoked what in me? A fear. Fear for myself and fear for those that I love. And I want to be with those that are like mine. That fear at the tremble. I don't like people that shut this book, never read this book, don't know this book, yet they want to tell me what another man says about this book. Book chapter verse. What does the word of God say about it? And they tremble at it. And they tremble at the words of God. Because of the transgression of those that had been carried away. And again, the second time that it says this, and he sat down. Now again, King James. 
stoned, astonished, just sat down dumbfounded with what he was seeing and what was going on. And again, if, if, if I would have, when I lived up the hill here, and we was doing Broken Before the Throne, the first one, and at that time, Joe Manchin was governor, and I don't even remember where I was working at that time. Got home, and Georgie, she's all ecstatic. She's all, you'll never believe who left the message on the machine. And I'm like, what are you talking about? She was like, come here, come here, come here, come here. You know, the old phone machine. So she hit it. Damn, Reverend Dan Bosman. This is Joe Manson, governor. I'm calling to talk to you. Got your, got your thing about broken before the throne. and The governor's calling me on my phone. A message. Wow. Boy, don't I feel something. I didn't even vote for the guy. Huh? But there he is. And, and, and you know what I would feel if, if, if President Trump would call me to say, hey, I've been reading your stuff on Twitter, since he's a big Twitter fan. Hey, I've been reading your stuff online. I've seen your sermons that have been broadcast. Hey, why don't you come down to D.C. and help us confess the sins of our nation and let's deal with this. I would sit down astonished. Much like I would have thought he would have been. Where in the world do you even start? How do you even begin to deal with this? He sat down astonished at what he was having to deal with. Do you ever just look out there? I get overwhelmed at times like this. Do you ever just look out there and think, I know it's going to get worse, but how in the world could it get any worse? Dumbfounded. I don't, can't believe that we're, that we're actually living like this. How did we get here? This was not the childhood that I was raised in. This wasn't like it was 20 years ago, 10 years ago. What happened? I sit down astonished. That we're living like this. You know, this is what he's talking about. We 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 lost our land. We lost our freedoms. We lost the, the temple. We lost the Ark of the Covenant. We lost our king because of our sin. We forsook God. And where are we at? He sits down astonished and says, we're playing with the same fire that burned us before. They hadn't got it, so he sat down a storm. Doomed to repeat history is what he's talking about here. So verse 7, or verse 6, and so he, I'm sorry, verse 5, I'll get right here in a minute. He sat down a storm until the evening sacrifice, and at the evening sacrifice, he says, and I rose from my heaviness. A great weight lays upon any individual that understands. And he says, having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees, humility, I spread out my hands unto the Lord my God, and I said, so this is where his prayer begins. He's now beginning to pray. Oh my God, I am ashamed, and I blush to lift up my face to you. My God, for our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass, it has grown up into the heavens. Can't we say the same thing? Isn't this a repeat of this? Since the days of our fathers have we been in great trespass unto this day. And for our iniquities have we, our kings, our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to spoil, to confusion of face, as it is this day. Twice in that verse, by the way, is this day. And now for a little space. Grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape, to give us a nail in his holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. The two littles there in that verse. Little space, little reviving. For we are bondmen, yet our God has not forsaken us in our bondage. But he has extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving. Revive us again, O Lord. To set up the house of our God, to repair the desolations thereof, to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. And now, O oh our God, what shall we say after this? We have forsaken your commandments, which thou hast commanded by your servants the prophets. This land unto which we go to possess it is an unclean land. 
filthiness of the people of the lands, with their abominations, they have filled it from one end to another with their uncleanness. Now therefore, give not your daughters unto their sons, neither take their daughters unto your sons, nor seek their peace or their wealth forever, that you may be strong and eat the good of the land, and leave it for an inheritance for your children forever. <clears throat> And after all that has come upon us for our evil deeds, for our great trespass, seeing that our God has punished us less than we actually deserve for our iniquities, and has given us such deliverance as this, should we again break the commandment, join in affinity with the people of these abominations? Wouldest not thou be angry with us till you had consumed us, so that there should be no remedy, nor escape? O Lord God of Israel, you are righteous. For we remain yet escaped as it is this day. Behold, we are before you in our trespasses. For we cannot stand before you because of all this. Chapter 10, verse 1. Now when Ezra had prayed, when he had confessed, weeping, casting himself down before the house of God, there assembled unto him out of Israel a great congregation, a very great congregation of men and women and children. And their response and the people wept very sore. You go down through each part of that, chapter 9, into chapter 10. The responses, the words, the phrases. Identifying, same thing. God in mercy extends to them a little bit of grace, a little bit of revival. I sent down to Family Research Council down in D.C. And uh, Pierre Bynum, who's the chaplain down there, wrote me back. I had sent to them, God has cut out a period of time for us right now. A short window, a little, little season of grace, a little season of, of opportunity that we could repent, get back to God as we ought to. Now again, I don't expect the government to do it. I, I can't foresee why we would expect the government to do it. I don't expect for the county commissioners to do it or the governor or anybody else to do it. I expect the church to do it. I expect us to do it. That we come to him, realizing our great trespass, realizing what we're living in the midst of. Again, you look at your family. You see your neighbors. What are they doing right now? What did they do today? Did they worship the Lord? I, I come over here with him, and, and we come by on the Sundays, and, and just like it was this past week, 70-something degrees, 81 steams, as I was told. What are they doing? Are they worshiping the Lord God, fearing Him, honoring Him? No. They got a ball in the back. They got the car hose out to wash the car. They've got the lawnmower out to mow the grass. Beat you to it. <laughs> They're doing everything but what they ought to be doing, aren't they? No fear of God. Oh, well, I believe in God. Oh, oh I... I the devils believe in God. You, the response of Ezra, he fell on his knees. The last time you fell on your knees, bad knees or not, I don't care. You fell on your knees because the hour was desperate. The moment was crisis. You get that phone call that says, hey, I got bad news for you. I just wanted to ask you to pray. We're on our way to the intensive care unit, the emergency room right now. You know it's a crisis. And they are requiring of you immediate prayer, aren't they, to deal with that crisis. We're in crisis. We're in crisis mode. It's just like getting that call at 2.30 in the morning. And you said, this ain't going to be good no matter what it is. It's never going to be good. I ain't never had anybody call me. Don't you do it. <laughs> call me at 2.30. I just wanted to see how he was doing. I've heard this funny joke. I just wanted to share it with you. Nobody ever does that at 2.30 in the morning. Really? When somebody's going to try that. I just know that <laughs> now that I said that. I will come after you. I will track you down. But those calls are tragic events, crisis events, and they compel you to get out of your comfort zone and say, I've got to respond. We've been living in this and the church hasn't responded. The church hasn't been moved. We know it. We see it, we hear it, but we're unmoved. 
So therefore the sin still remains. Ezra was automatically going about saying, in this little window that we've got, we've got to do something. My fear is, is that I don't know how big the window is. I don't think anybody really does. Do we got to the end of the year? I don't think it has a thing to do with Trump. It has to do with the sins of our past. Our forefathers, he said. Our fathers have been engaged in this. We, and you said, did you read that where it says, and we, they have covered the land with uncleanness and defilement. How much blood comes from 61 million babies? Enough to cover from east, west to coast, east to west and north to south? My golly, Chicago shootings and deaths would be enough to fill the streets of, of that. That's the danger of like that shooting in Sheets. You have, as I said, every year if you have blood on the ground, God requires the blood at somebody's hands, doesn't he? That's Old Testament. Thou shalt not kill. And if you do kill, then you reap what you chose to do, right? Well, they're killing, but they're not reaping what they, punishment. Therefore, the sin still remains. You said, but I've never committed an abortion. I've never murdered anybody. But we live in a land that has. We live next to people. I, I would be, if you would have revival break out, you would see massive amounts of, of people in the church, Christians, that have lived under the regret and the shame of abortions for decades, never confessed it, because they were scared about where they would be uh, labeled. In that. But they would confess. They would say, I'm guilty of this. When revivals broke out in China. And Welsh revival. And all the mothers that I was talking about earlier. Uh, leaning before the, the great wars. And those kind of things that happened. There was always great depths of sin. That were confessed. That nobody knew about. But that individual. But they had to confess it. They had to get rid of it. Now the difference is. Like out in Wheaton, Illinois. Richard Owen Roberts told me that in, in the 1980s, a revival broke out, a spirit of sorrow broke out, like what we're reading about here. It was a chapel service, and they had a microphone set up. So when the preacher preached the sermon, all these students started coming forward, and they were confessing. I've got drugs back in my dorm. I've got pornography back in my dorm. And they went and they got all that stuff and the, and the hard liquor and the beer and all those things. This was a Christian college. I mean, if this was a Christian college and these were the future ministers of the churches in the 1980s and they brought their stuff, and, you know those, uh, not, not normal trash bags, but uh, contractor trash bags, you know, bigger, heavier things. They filled dozens of those things. With all the paraphernalia of sin that was in the locker room, in, in the locker rooms and the dorms. Oh, I've confessed my sin. I've, I've shared, and again, they felt great victory. Everybody celebrating. And you said, all oh, revivals broke out. Five months later, they're right back doing what they was doing. That's not revival. That's an emotional moment. That they wanted to cleanse themselves. You see, revival keeps you in it. It's a lifelong pursuit. When you read about those revivals, like in 1850s that I was talking about, in the Welsh revival, 80% of all converts served out the rest of their days in oneness with the Lord. And they never returned to their sins. High percentage of people that come to Christ in the right way, Ezra, confessing the sin, resolving the sin, taking care of the sin, they never go back to it. When it becomes a man, emotional charge, they'll go back to it. I don't want nothing to do with that. I want this. Where the sin is laid out, sin is dealt with, it's never gone back to it. 
the idea of this is, is that let God do what only God can do in this. You can't legislate, judiciarize, that's not a word, is it? But I just made it up. Judicial edict, judiciarize. You all go use that somewhere this week and see, make you look, make you look smart. You can't put those things out there and say, we fixed it. See, that's what the church thought they would do by putting Trump in. We fixed this. We ain't fixed nothing. The sin still remains. So when I pick up the paper and I see a transgender help me, boy, girl, boy, a boy wrestling in a girls wrestling tournament because he thought she, he thought she was a girl and won the state championship. And you're thinking, there's something about How did we get here? That's when I sit down astonished. One, that they would allow it. Two, that somewhere somebody would say, wait a minute. That ain't right. But they blink at it. Well, that's someone's child. Well, that's, that's, that's okay. It's all right. Don't get upset, Dan. Well, you get upset because God's upset. And you realize the high consequences of sins in a society. And that you realize is that that incident is going to be a catalyst for how many more hundreds and thousands coming behind them. That's the reason that they never like to tout suicides in a community. Why? Because it becomes a pattern. For someone else that's dejected, someone else that's depressed, and someone else that says, I don't know how to deal with this, they take matters into their own hands and it becomes an epidemic. How? Go up to Concord, in, up, up in New England. There's a campus up there that in the last, since September of, of the school year at this university, it's an offshoot of Harvard. They've had nine or eleven suicides by these students because it becomes a pattern and what does Satan come to do? He comes to kill, to maim, and to destroy. What's he doing? He's killing, maiming, and destroying the epidemics of our society because sin is blinked at. Well, it's just an isolated case. I thought that about murder-suicides, but what did I read about before I come over here? Down in Florida. Man is a strange wife. He goes in and kills her and her lesbian lover. Kills them both. And this whole town is upset because of two school teachers out of the middle school. Nobody's upset that it was a divorce. and Nobody's upset that it was a lesbian affair. Nobody cares about that. Nobody cares that three lives have been taken and the blood is on the ground. Who's going to answer for it? You see the consequences of sin? Every Sin matters to God, doesn't it? Because it mattered to Christ on the cross. We can sit here and sing, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, all to him I freely give, Jesus paid it all. That doesn't take care of the sin that's out there. Or the sin in here. Or the sin in here. We don't confess it and repent of it. Ezra was facing what he feared was God doing, getting ready to remove them. They had been given a little season of revival, a little window. But he realized that God could take that away in a blink of an eye. He immediately wanted to respond. That's what God's waiting on. Not that God's not wanting to do it or unable to do it. He's waiting on his people. You and I, to see the consequences of sin, to see it in our hearts, to see it in our families, to see it in the churches, and to say, Father, we've sinned against you. We've forsaken you and forgotten your commandments. We've departed as a nation from what you raised us in. We are not the same people that we used to be a generation ago. But Lord, we've, we've contaminated the land from coast to coast. And Lord, whatever you decide to do to us, we know you're, you're right. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Yes, he will. But Lord... In wrath. Do what? And remember mercy. Mercy for me. Mercy for my church. Mercy for my family. Mercy for our nation. For the next generation. 
So I'm not worried about me. I don't care. I am scared to death what they're going to be living with in another 10 years, 20 years. We can't go on like this so that I get to that place. Anger. Holy anger. It's not an anger about me just putting a hole through the wall or through him. It ain't that. It's the holy anger that God has in all of his people that we know the consequences. The wages of sin, death. That, what are we seeing? What, what are we seeing? Death and die. Death and die. Death and die. Death and die. Throw the emergency guard. In the season that God has given to us. I'm thought it lasted.